If 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 I can ask everyone to have a seat. If I can ask everyone to have a seat, we'd like to get started. How are you doing, Tim? Ramadan Kareem, happy Easter, happy Passover. Uh, welcome and thank you for joining us today for an important discussion of critical issues confronting Yemen. When the issue of Yemen comes up for discussion, the focus is almost entirely on the prospects for negotiating an end to the fighting and reestablishing a government in Sana'a. Yet negotiating a conclusion to the now eight-year-old civil conflict in Yemen will only be the start of a prolonged challenge to rebuild and reconstruct the shattered state. Today, we're going to have an opportunity to dig into some of the other issues that are going to be of critical importance if Yemen is to emerge from this conflict in a form that can provide Yemenis with a stable, secure, and hopefully prosperous future. Our first panel today, Building a New Yemen, will delve into two critical prerequisites that the Yemenis must achieve to reach an historical re uh, reconciliation that can sustain peace and then gain the support of regional neighbors and the international community to start building a new Yemen. The authors of the book, Building a New Yemen, Recovery, Transition, and the International Community are here with us on the screen to discuss their comprehensive plan for a post-conflict Yemen. The researchers who span the fields of international relations, political economy, and climate will each address in detail the key political, social, and economic concerns associated with, fo with a focused, intelligent intervention. Moderating this conversation will be our good friend, Amat Alim Asoswa the co-editor of Building a New Yemen. Over the course of her storied career, Ahmad has worked as a journalist and served as Yemen's first female ambassador and the Yemeni government cabinet as minister for human rights. In the UN system, Ahmad served as an assistant secretary general, then assistant administrator, and finally director of the UNDP Regional Bureau for Arab States. So uh, Ahmad, may I ask you to take the stage and uh, begin the conversation. Good morning, everybody. Thank you very much, Jerry and the Middle East Institute and DT Institute for the opportunity to try and highlight some of the most urgent, I would say, issues that uh, my beloved country is facing, especially after the span of the last nine year of conflict. We came here in Ramadan and Ramadan Kareem to those who are observing it. And with Ramadan also comes another hope, as you know, in our culture, in our societies, because it's also a month of peace. And on the rhythm as well of everything that is happening in the region recently, we are hoping and striving and hoping also to see and, uh, that our people will finally, finally have the right to live in peace with dignity amongst themselves and also to forge a peace that will also guarantee a very stable and secured neighborhood where our neighbors and the international community will come to help also the Yemeni people in reaching to this very important objective. Without a further ado, because we have uh, a group of very distinguished uh, speakers, writers, and lit uh, not least, of course, the audience whom I am really thrilled to see here today. So I will definitely go ahead directly 
so that uh, we benefit from their very uh, deep insight. And uh, let me just say one more sentence before we do that. And this is not at all any attempt. It's not an attempt to bring about a comprehensive uh, look at what Yemen might look like, inshallah, when there is a peace. Rather, it is just a, a way of trying to shed lights on the most pressing issues, whereby again, that we will have to continue to rely on the will, the very strong will of the Yemeni people and that of its neighbors and the international community to bring about this beautiful and most fascinating country to the track of peace and development and sustainability. I have uh, a very distinguished colleagues here and I'm really, really humbled always when I am in, in their presence, although I'm afraid that I can see them there. But uh, let me start by uh, introducing uh, our friend and colleague and my special also tutor, if you will, and uh, mentor, Mr. Uh, Noel Berhuni, who uh, gave me as well the honor of sitting with him and co-editing this book that we are discussing today. And it suffices to say that uh, Noel has worked in Yemen for a long time as a former British diplomat, but also he has written a number of books. The latest uh, ones of them is uh, Yemen Divided, and before that, also, he wrote a book on Hadramaut, on the business also idea of what Hadramaut means. And I would like also to say that uh, uh, he also, and after him, will have also the distinguished other colleagues who have done also the most difficult job of actually writing those different chapters of that report. And it suffices also to say that uh, you might be surprised that there are no Yemeni, no other Yemeni speakers today. Unfortunately, it was just due to the time and also the uh, circumstances of Ramadan, but we had more than uh, seven to eight other Yemeni uh, fellow, uh, fellow writers and authors, men and women from Yemen and also from the Yemeni diaspora outside who wrote the totality of, of this book. So over to you, Noel, without further ado. Thank you very um, much. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Ahmed, and, and uh, uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everybody. In the book, we set out to examine the challenges that would confront any Yemeni government or governments in rebuilding the country. Today, we're focusing on the economy, but the book also dealt with Yemen's interaction with the outside world, the future structure of the state, sectarianism, tribalism, and the rise of the Houthis, the challenges posed by Al-Qaeda and ISIS, uh, and, and two of our colleagues, uh, uh, female academics from Salah University, looked at the role of women in the future of Yemen. We asked the authors to come, come up with new thinking, but also to have regard for policies well, that worked uh, or did not work in the past. Rafat al Khali, an Yemen economist who was unable to join us today, made two important points. Traditional post-conflict recovery tends to follow a phase sequence, relief and humanitarian assistance, followed by in integration of fighters and internally displaced people, of which there are millions, rebuilding uh, of infrastructure, and finally, intervention to stimulate economic growth. And the other point is that the international experience of post-conflict situations indicates that unless there is substantial improvement in the first year, there's a 40% chance of return to conflict. Clearly, that's going to require uh, uh, the inflow of large sums, uh, and it's very likely that Yemen's neighbors, with a strong vested interest in the stability of Yemen, will provide the bulk of that. However, what we don't know is what sort of government or governments would exist, and what capacity they will have to absorb, manage, and direct that assistance to establish and establish priorities. There's, there's optimism currently that the current talks between the Houthis and Saudis, the efforts by the UN Special Envoy, and the agreement between Iran and Saudi Arabia will lead to a long, long extension and widening of the current truce, truce and a path to peace negotiations between the Yemeni participants in what began and remains a civil war uh, between the internationally recognized government, currently in the form of the Presidential Liberation Council, the PLC, and Ansar Ansa Allah, that is the Houthis, uh, uh, who operate through the Supreme Political Council. 
The, the PLC area covers roughly 70-75% of Yemeni territory, but the Ansar Lark control 70, around 70% 70 of Yemen's population, as well as the capital Sana'a and associated ministries and state organizations. Most of Yemen's oil and gas fields are in uh, areas controlled by the PLC, and these, in the past at least, were used to generate uh, a large proportion of Yemen's foreign exchange earnings, which were needed to pay for the cost of imports of food and other staples. The limited export of oil that's been possible um, uh, uh, from the PLC area came to a virtual halt recently following threats by the Houthis to attack export facilities unless the income is used to pay salaries for Houthi state employees, including their military. This is one example of the economic war that has continued despite the, the hope, hopefully soon to end uh, uh, real war. The PLC is, is, managed, is, is uh, chaired by the experienced Rashad Al-Alimi and is made up of seven vice presidents, some of whom control powerful militias or military units or have local power bases. Some have different interests and visions of a future Yemen. The Southern Transition Council wants to re-establish an independent southern state. The former PDRY, which I, which I was a diplomat, lies within the area are, are, are controlled by the PLC, but the PLC area also includes Marib, where the most important gas and oil are located, uh, which has uh, acquired substantial co co autonomy during the war, and Taiz, Yemen's second city, a divided city at the moment, uh, but an important economic center uh, since med medieval times been part of the north. In both places, there are strong political groups who do not, who want to, uh, Yemen to remain united as do the Houthis. Such divisions are these are, are less visible in the Houthi areas, but do exist. We speculated that all might see the need for a federal or confederal state with a relatively small central government, at least initially, to manage the inflow assistance required to build the country. Beneath it, there might be two powerful regions based on the uh, SPC and PLC, or possibly several regions reflecting the current realities on the ground, the geographical distribution of resources, and the way the war has strengthened some regional actors. Post-war development will not be effective unless there's agreement on managing the economy and dealing with such issues, for example, as the uh, repair and development of the shared in infrastructure. Uh, one of the intentions of the book was to help provide ideas on, so on how some of these problems might be overcome. Uh, and the three chapter authors will now go into some detail on this. Sorry, Hello? I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Laura. Okay. Okay. I will say again briefly that uh, uh, Laurent Bonfoy has been uh, also teaching in universities in the region and beyond, including in Sana'a University, in Muscat University, as well, in addition to some other also French universities. But he has also focused his work on the Salafism movement in the Arabian Peninsula too. Uh, he speaks fluent Arabic. His Arabic is much better than mine. And when I don't say this mildly, I feel jealous of him. But in addition to that, he has been this very important chapter on this book, which is about the role, the role of the international community, which he describes as fragmented. So over to you, Laura. And uh, after that, I will be careful about the microphone. Thank you. Over to you. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you all for attending. Unfortunately, we can't see uh, the audience, but I'm sure it's uh, it's packed with uh, with very uh, interesting uh, people and uh, and people who are keen to see the situation in in Yemen uh, improved. Um, my uh, my focus, and this is what we had discussed with uh, with Ahmad, uh, Noel, Charles, and Helen, um, was uh, to to discuss 
the the issue of the competing narratives and i think that uh, one of the reasons and this is what i highlighted in the chapter that uh, there is a fragmented approach to the yemeni conflict since uh, 2015 or we could even say since 2014 is that you have you do have competing narratives uh throughout the chapter i had uh, highlighted three of them uh, the first being a narrative regarding uh, the, the issue of legitimacy, meaning that the war uh, was a matter of competing legitimacies, uh, basically the one of the so-called uh, legitimate government uh, acknowledged, uh, whose legi legitimacy is acknowledged uh, through uh, um, uh, different uh, 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 regulations, a uh, different uh, um resolutions of the um uh, security council uh also which is meant to be acknowledged uh, through uh the yemeni constitution but there is discussion on this uh, and you do have different competing uh, visions regarding this issue of legitimacy with the houthis uh, themselves considering that uh, there is some other form of legitimacy um, the second uh narrative which which emerged and which has been pushed forward by uh uh, the Houthis, but also a number of people who criticize, um, especially the, uh, what the uh, Arab coalition has been doing, is a focus on imperialism, considering that uh, overall, when you think about the war, uh, it is a matter of uh, uh, domination and neo-imperialism some form of neo-colonialism. And this has really been pushed forward when you hear uh, in different uh, different media, among different circles, um, with NGOs, etc. The third uh, um, narrative, which I thought was meaningful, uh, has been focusing on the regional dimensions of the war. Uh, and also considering that what is happening in Yemen is uh, basically a kind of proxy war, which is happening between two regional powers, uh, one obviously being uh, Iran, the second being Saudi Arabia, and they've sort of found a battlefield in Yemen with a number of uh, sectarian dimensions. So describing the, the conflict as one which is uh, 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 deeply uh, regionalized. And so these, uh, these three narratives sort of compete and you find out that uh, there is a lot of fragmentation due to the fact that, uh, that uh, uh, the different players which are involved in the war, be they NGOs, be they media, be they diplomats or, uh, or warlords in a way, so kind of position themselves along these, these three narratives. What is happening currently is that uh, uh, while the uh, legitimacy narrative was uh, probably the one which, which was dominant, uh, in part due to the um, uh, UN resolutions and to the, the, the uh, policies of international organizations. So that is a focus on the legitimacy of the uh, government. Well, there is a, this, uh, this new trend um, to see seeing uh, the, um, uh, the spread of another uh, narrative, which is one focusing on um, the regional dimension. Uh, and basically through the recent agreement between Iran and Saudi Arabia, considering that in the end, uh, the Yemeni war is a, a, a proxy war and that the way of solving it is to manage almost exclusively uh, this uh, regional level. Um, also adding to this, you do have uh, had over the last year or so, a bilateral uh, negotiations, almost you could say uh, unilateral ones between the Saudi government and the Houthis. You could say they are unilateral in the sense that the Houthis are not uh, 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 in themselves a legitimate uh, player when it comes to international law. Um, and so this, uh, this kind of unilateral dimension, the way of solving the conflict has, was one which involves Saudi Arabia directly with uh, the, the, the Houthis is, uh, is one which uh, is um, also problematic. I mean, it can, it can be very useful for the livelihoods of Yemenis, and I think that it is important to take into account. But if the international community is, is to try and have a kind of holistic approach to the situation in Yemen, 
it must not consider that uh, uh, activating these levers uh, of a kind of unilateral approach to things uh, can, can actually solve the conflict. Because what it does is also conceal the local uh, dimension of the war. It conceals the role of uh, Yemeni actors themselves who do play a part. And uh, uh, also it, uh, it can uh, lead to whitewashing the responsibility of a number of regional players who just by backing off and saying that, okay, we've established peace, then there is no longer any conflict, then there is no reason for us to be involved. There is no reason for us to participate when it comes to, uh, to reconstruction, can be a limit, uh, limited view to the, to, to the war. Uh, and this is why it's also important to, for the international community, for diplomats, for NGOs, for um, uh, the UN, to fully acknowledge that you do have these competing narratives and that basically all three are, uh, are relevant and should be taken into account if one is, one, uh, is to, to actually tackle the different, uh, different issues which are at stake. Thank you so much, Laura. Uh, I think this is also a good time uh, that we uh, move the discussion and listen as well to my friend and sister, Dr. Helen Lechner, who is uh, by all means uh, a Yemeni, uh, because she did not only work on Yemen or about Yemen from abroad or from the outset, but she lived in Yemen. She did live uh, at least for 15 consecutive years in Yemen where she immediately and directly was involved on the whole realm of uh, development, especially local development. And this is a very, very important component for any solution for the future of Yemen. It suffices as well me to say here that she has written her last book uh, is called Yemen in Crisis, but uh, she did not stop at that, uh, that only book. She has written so many other books and so many continued level of uh, almost a monthly engagement with the Arab Digest and with other also well-known uh, platforms where she continues to focus the uh, issues on the development and the future of the uh, Yemeni uh, economy and development, but through the participation and the local lens. Over to you, Helen. Great, well, thank you very much, Amat. And uh, I thought I'd be speaking after Charles, but um, I shall adjust accordingly. And thank you to the MEI and everybody for inviting us and giving us this opportunity. I'm gonna talk basically about water and agriculture. And I'd like to start by taking a few seconds to express my absolute outrage at the fact that the, this year is the first UN Water Conference for 46 years. Moreover, it's not even a decision-making conference. When there are uh, issues of water shortages in many, many parts of the world and billions of people are, are suffering from this. And I will now go into what I'm supposed to talk about, which is the situation in Yemen, where basically Yemen does, is not the worst country in the world for water supplies, but it's pretty close. And it's a country where basically one third of the water that is used annually is uh, from fossil aquifers, i.e. it is not renewable, which means that the renewable supply is quite insufficient for current needs. Uh, currently, the availability per capita of water is estimated at about 80 cubic meters per, per person per annum of renewable water. That compares with 500, which is considered the basic by certain criteria, and 1,000, which is considered the basic by other international criteria. So that gives you an idea of the incredible desperate situation of water. And we're already in a situation where villages have been abandoned simply because there was no longer any water for people to use for domestic supplies. So this is a major fundamental problem. And if it's not addressed, and if it's not addressed seriously, um, there will be forced migration first within the country, which is already happening, but then it will be outside the country. And taking a quick look at the map and a quick understanding of the state of the region, Yemenis are not going to be going to Somalia and Ethiopia. We still have Somalis and Ethiopians coming to Yemen despite the current situation. 
they will be going north and east, which is, means the neighbors. And I think, you know, this is the water issue is really so fundamental. We have to really realize that it's, you know, peace, no peace, whatever happens, it has to be addressed because if without it, substantial parts of Yemen will be uninhabitable within less than a generation, more likely than not. Now, the next point is basically that the, the, the issue is not desperate. It can be dealt with. Yemen, like most countries, is using more than more close to 90 percent estimate of the water used is used in agriculture and a lot of that in irrigation. And I'll come into that in a moment. So, you know, this can be dealt with very simply by making sure that human domestic water and followed by livestock and possibly followed by industry, that's something that really would need to be studied further. If these are given priority and they are managed adequately, Yemenis will not be forced out of their country. But this will mean controlling basically uh, irrigation, particularly controlling uh, deep well pump irrigation. Um, I thought a few years ago that one of the, the few positive side effects of the war would be that the, the fuel crisis would prevent the, the, a lot of the irrigation that's been using up far too much water. But on this one, what's happened is that the Yemeni farmers, who are very bright, have simply replaced electricity, um, diesel, by solar pumps. So again, one has to be really careful. And actually, with solar pumping, you can actually extract even more water faster. So, you know, this is, a, this is not a solution. The solution to uh, overuse in irrigation is a solution that involves basically very serious fundamental state intervention combined with pressure from the population in the sense that the population primarily needs um, access to domestic water supplies. And when we come to, you know, when we come to look at the situation of agriculture, you know, agriculture is the fundamental element of life in Yemen. Um, just as Noel pointed out earlier, the majority of the Yemeni population live under Houthi rule. At the same time, not the same proportion, but about 70% of the population throughout the country remain rural. This is true despite the fact that agriculture does not produce more than about 20% of the country's GDP. But, you know, even in rural areas, well over half the population is dependent on agriculture. So, you know, one of the elements of reconstructing the economy or constructing a new type of economy is going to be to really change the approach to agriculture. Another of the, in my view, shocking facts, if you look at the development in the past 50, 30 years or 40 years since unification, sorry, 30 years since unification, is you know the agricultural policies that have been implemented by the state and by the government throughout that period have focused on irrigated agriculture for export crops. Now, a country that is as short of water as Yemen is should not be exporting its water, whether it's virtual water in the form of bananas and mangoes, or whether it's you know actual piped water, which is not the case. Uh, this is not appropriate. What is needed in terms of agricultural development and which is absolutely essential is very, very important research and development of rain-fed agriculture. At the moment, still 50 or 60 percent approximately of the, of the land is cultivated with rain-fed agriculture. Most of these holdings are very small holdings. They are no longer sufficient to keep a household. Um, when I first worked in the 90s in the rural areas, people's primary source of income in the rural areas were agriculture and livestock. By the time we got to 25, 2005 and later, you know, the first source of a household income was that of men working in the towns, in mostly in unskilled labor, simply because the, the size of the holdings had shrunk over, over the period through inheritance and the production was, in, was insufficient. And here again, we have to look at the impact of climate change and droughts and, and, and floods, which are, you know, don't really have the time to go into these right now. So I will just very quickly try and say, you know, what 
re-emphasize the points that I want to make, which is that, you know, water management and water management to ensure the availability of basic supplies to the population is the absolute number one essential activity, which has to be addressed by any government ruling any part of the country. And here I'll just remind people, which I failed to say earlier, that, you know, the water situation is not the same everywhere. You cannot treat Yemen as a sort of one size fits all situation. You know, you have to really look at the situation at the level of water basins, of water, you know, water sheds, et cetera, and availability also of groundwater. So it's all, you know, it does require a very sophisticated analysis, but it also requires a combination of very firm uh, government intervention to prevent uh, excessive irrigation and excessive drawdown and you know other aspects which also need to be addressed which is the urban supply which mostly will come from rural areas so you know the, these things are all essential without them there will be increased political tensions when people move out of villages and go to areas where there's more water what happens it increases the population there it demands they, they demand more um, services, they demand more everything, it, more jobs, more other activities, so that results in increased social tension, which are the kind of things that indirectly or eventually can uh, lead to more conflict. Of course, the absence of water and the absence of proper, of proper economic and agricultural development worse in poverty, which is already, you know, currently at 80%, but even before the war was already almost 50%. So we're talking about a country where people were, were already very poor. So I'll just finish with, you know, a few recommendations, which is number one, we need a strong state at regional and central power as at central levels, which will work with rep in representation and address primarily the needs of the population for domestic supplies. That is essential to avoid uh, forced migration. Domestic needs must be prioritized, and it has to be done on the basis of, uh, you know, of agreed uh, mechanisms. For example, rural urban transfers. I mean, there's a prime example of, of the situation in Thais in the 90s or even since the 80s. Uh, which many I've written about and others, you know, where, you know, the, the attempt to transfer rural water to Thais, which is desperate for water, was so badly managed that basically everybody was unhappy and there was no water in Thais. And there still is no water in Thais, as far as I know. You need to work out an adequate and the best possible balance for an equitable process and use of water, particularly the balance between industry and agriculture in the future, because that means uh, understanding, you know, basically the the, the best co cost benefit ratio that in terms of everybody's uh, sustainability that again would require some very serious studies. And uh, as I said earlier, absolutely fundamental serious research and investment in rain fed agriculture to improve staple crops, to be more effective and to be sure, you know, more drought resistant and better able to cope, as well as, as cash crops, because people also will need to have, have cash crops. Agri irrigated agriculture has to be controlled within sustainable use of the resource. And, you know, finally, as I said earlier, no one size fits all. Uh, so, you know, th these are issues that affect about 70% of the Yemeni people. So they are very fundamental. And I hope that I've managed to say a few things fairly clear. Thank you very much, Helen. Uh, that was a very important uh, closing to uh, your also uh, presentation. And I would like now to uh, invite Charles Schmitz, where uh, also uh, we can see again that the, uh, the smooth also transition between the presentations of the uh, different speakers. Uh, he is also going to close in this particular uh, instance, uh, the uh, discussion on the economic, if you will, dilemma and question or crisis, if you will. And Charles is also no stranger from Yemen and the developments in Yemen. He himself also has been to Yemen. 
he taught, I thought, and I found it very interesting that also he spent some time as well in Lahj, in, in the south of Yemen in the 1990s, in addition, of course, to his continued level of uh, contacts and continuation, but most importantly, his very wealthy as well knowledge uh, about Yemen. And uh, he has written this very intriguing chapter about the uh, a parasitical political economy. Uh, he is going to focus on this and he has a very unique also uh, take on those issues. So over to you, uh, Charles. And after that, I must uh, also alert all the audience here. We will be ready to take uh, any questions from you that you, you might have for the speakers. And let's make sure they're going to be also short and to the point so that we benefit from the vast knowledge of our speakers. Over to you, Charles. Thank you, Ahmad. And thank you, everybody, for attending. This is always uh, interesting to talk with people who are experienced in Yemen. Um, I, I don't have a whole lot more to say. Helen said a lot of it. Uh, I mean, I, I take Helen's main point is that Yemen, in its natural resources and agriculture, needs uh, a strong state. It needs a strong state that manages the water resources. Uh, and, and this is critical for economic development. Um, strong state uh, intervention uh, is not an anathema to economic growth. In fact, in a, in a place like Yemen, it's, it's essential to guiding the economy towards uh, managing natural resources, towards uh, uh, reaching social stability and so issues of social equity, maintaining social peace. Um, but uh, you, there is no, the relationship between the economy and the state, of course, is complex. There's no one uh, model that fits all. Um, uh, but in the case of Yemen, um, the, there has been strong state intervention, but unfortunately, it's been negative intervention. Uh, the economy has been weaponized. The economy is, is a tool of war at this point. Um, even before the outbreak of war under Al Abd al he used it as a political tool. He used it to build coalitions. He he used it to dole out favors to to key families and regions and and people. Um, and uh, the ex to the extent to which the economy is weaponized, it means that private investment is going to stay away uh, unless they have political protection. So I, I want to point out that there is money to be made in Yemen. Uh, there's a battle right now uh, between uh, uh, commercial uh, houses about who's going to control the markets in Yemen and uh, who's going to control the oil and who's going to control uh, you know, the, the banking system. Uh, and it has become, since the, uh, since the uh, ceasefire, uh, it's almost as if uh, the, the war has been transferred from the battlefront to the economic front. Uh, and of course, everybody is aware of the, the Houthis use of the drones to ward off any exports of oil. Um, but uh, the Houthi have uh, done other uh, things to, to try and enhance their political position. Uh, and the most clear I saw was they closed off uh, the, the border between or the, the battle line between North and South. And so in effect, they're forcing all the Adeni uh, houses to transfer to, to Hodeida. Um, if you do this, I mean, of course, those merchants are making money. Um, the Houthi are making sure that they get a cut of it, but you're not going to make fixed investments. You're not going to think long term uh, uh, about investing in Yemen unless you have uh, political security in a system like that. Um, and so I guess uh, I just want to conclude by saying that, uh, you know, the we need a strong state in Yemen, as, as Helen quite clearly showed. Uh, but that state has to be one that is uh, not politically biased, that everybody buys into. Otherwise, you're not going to get growth. Otherwise, the private sector is going to be highly polarized and be very careful about investments. Um, and so, I, you know, in this sense, it's, it's not only uh, parasitic, but also pessimistic, because I don't see, uh, you know, a, a quick out of this one. I, I see this as a, a, the economy as part of 
a battle that's going to go on for quite some time. And so we're not going to see, uh, you know, a real uptick in the enemy economy until we have a true long-term solution. Uh, as uh, it is said here, it's economy, stupid, right? And I think it has been also uh, the uh, almost final take from all your wonderful input today uh, is to again, uh, how important it is to look at uh, to look back at the historical development of Yemen and to learn from the mistakes of the past to build on the best of whatever experiences that might have uh, or will be used in favor of the Yemeni people who have really suffered most. Uh, and I think it is uh, also uh, important to mention that we cannot, of course, forge from where we are sitting here, uh, the way that Yemen will look like at any event when inshallah there will be peace. But the most important thing is not to forget about the right of the Yemeni people to come to terms with the conflict, what has happened to reach a national reconciliation, which is the most prerequisite for any further work for future. And of course, that reach to that reconciliation will only be doable if Yemen will be actually surrounded, not just by love, by its neighbors and by the international community, most importantly, by the genuine cooperation and support, which will have also to take different shapes and forms and to learn also from the mistakes of the past. So, Again, I would like to uh, uh, give the audience the floor now to ask the uh, speakers. So I will start with you, Mr. Atawi. And I uh, just also wanted to, uh, to mention, I'm sure you have read uh, all his latest as well, uh, articles about the current agreement between Iran and Saudi Arabia. But the most recent one was spot on. So please, Mr. Atawi, thank you. Uh, my question is, could, could... Could you all explain the banking system? Is there, just, is there one banking system? Are there two? Do the Houthis have their own banking system? Uh, does the so-called central bank have uh, affiliates all through the country? Can, explain a little bit how the financial system works. Thank you. Can we take also other questions? And then uh, we'll see. Please, young lady. Go ahead. Thank you. Thank you very much for the insights on uh, Yemen. And I'm interested to know if there is any collaboration with the Green Fund, uh, Green Climate Fund in South Korea, uh, as they have Yemen in one of the priorities um, in the priority list for countries who will face the issues of, of the climate change, lack of rain, but also the forced migration um climate related migration not necessarily the conflict related migration is there any insight on that so who would like to take uh, mr atawi's question and also our young colleague here uh, question so may i ask who uh, helen would you like to answer the question on the central bank and the system of the banks in yemen but briefly please go ahead yeah, well, I'll start, I'll try and explain the banking system very briefly, and I think Charles can probably correct me and improve things. Basically, there was one bank and one central bank. In 2016, the internationally recognized government transferred it to Aden, but they couldn't do that because the Asanani and the Houthis continued to control some of the basic elements of the central bank. So currently, there are two central banks, one in Aden and one in Sana'a. And, eat, and the central bank traditionally in Yemen has a branch in every governorate capital, which is used for disbursing basically um, salaries and other things. So, for example, in Maghreb and in Hadda and in Mukalla, this local central bank is receiving a portion of the oil income, of course, when there is an oil income, which is not the case at the moment. So basically, that's what you have. You now have two competing central banks. And you now have basically a divided, effectively a divided currency. I think I'll stop there. Maybe Charles can add something later. 
Uh, on the issue of the Green Climate Fund, I, I know that Yemen has some connection with it, but I don't actually know whether it is part of the priority list. I haven't actually seen the details of the climate of the Green Climate Fund. I don't really know enough about it. But I mean, a lot of what I've said about water is also, you know, I mean, obviously water is part of the environment. And a lot of the current displacement, particularly in the last two years, has been related to mainly floods. Uh, if you look at the details of the displacement figures, which the IOM produce every month or actually every week, um, you know, there's been very considerable displacement because there have been very, very serious floods in the last three years, in 2021 and 22, and it looks like there might be some at the moment. So I'll stop here because other people, to give other people a chance. Thank you. Charles, would you like to add anything here? Yeah, just a, a little bit. Um, uh, as, as Helen said, uh, there are branches of the, of the central bank throughout Yemen, and they uh, receive income and they transfer it to the central bank, to the main central bank. And that's why the government moved the bank to uh, Aden because the money was going to Sana'a where, where the Houthi were using it for their war effort. So they wanted to, to cut off the sources of income uh, for the Houthi war effort. But um, there's another interesting aspect to that in that um, the, the legitimate government or the Hadi government uh, began uh, printing more money and uh, the Houthi uh, were able to uh, forbid the, the use of those new bills in the areas that they controlled. It shows the state capacity of the Houthi. It's quite incredible that they were able to, to forbid the use and they effectively forbade the use of that uh, currency, the new currency in, in, uh, in, in the areas they control. So you have this very interesting situation where uh, it's one currency, it's the Yemeni real, but in the South you have hyperinflation because the government has been printing and printing lots of money uh, and uh, it, it's been causing inflation. Whereas in the North, where the, they, they have a lack of currency, you have a recession due, due to a, a, a lack of money circulating because they're only using the old bills that are slowly deteriorating. Um, so that it shows the degree to which even the banking system, you know, the currency has become a, a weapon of war. So there is a war economy and economic war uh, altogether, as you can imagine. Uh, please, anybody else, please. Thank you very much. Uh, I have a question for Mr. Uh, Laurent Bonovo uh, about the narratives. He did mention that uh, there is an international narrative and regional narrative uh, that's been displaying now in, uh, in Yemen. Uh, so my question is, uh, to what extent uh, you see the similarities or agreement points of agreements between the regional and international uh, narrative and to what extent you see the opposition or the kind of the contradiction between the two thank you thank you my question is for dr lackner um thank you so much for speaking today um you spoke about a uh, need for strong state management of water resources. And my question is, in the interim, where can localized management of water and energy resources prove successful? And um, where is decentralized management of these resources working um, that can better inform eventual stronger state solutions? Hi, <clears throat> I have a, another question for uh, for uh, Dr. Schmidt uh, regarding the commercial houses that you mentioned. Could you elaborate a little bit on that and how much that cuts across the different sectarian or ideological lines and how possible would it be for there to be some kind of agreement met, for example, between commercial interests at that level uh, in a peace agreement that might not necessarily work to the benefit of the broader population of Yemen, kind of like a situation in Lebanon where you have elites of the different sectarian groups will often have shared commercial interests. They'll divvy up the, the spoils, so to speak, in order to come to a, uh, you know, a, a temporary pause in a conflict, whereas the general population is not necessarily benefiting from that peace or from any kind of economic benefit thereof. So is that a kind of similar situation that might happen in Yemen as part of a post-conflict uh, agreement? Uh, 
Uh, yes, hello. Um, we know that Iran um, uh, helped uh, the its allies in, in the Middle East uh, with uh, uh, economical support from drug. So my question is, if if there is like a, if they are uh, tracking any anything that's happening in in Yemen, that Iran is helping, you know, the the, the any any parties uh, with the drug uh, that can feed the the, the war, uh, which I I believe that affects the the peace building. Thank you. Yes, hi, thank you guys so much. Uh, I had another question for Laurent. I was hoping you could expand um, on the first question when you're talking a little bit about the regional dimensions and the and the proxy nature of the war. I was hoping you could expand a little bit on the role of an accountability mechanism in post-conflict uh, reconciliation and reconstruction and where you, where you might see that um shaping out in terms of a political solution and how we how we factor in an accountability mechanism not only for uh the regional actors in the war as well as the local Yemeni actors as well all right thank you very much uh okay so i think it's laura helen charles and then anybody else who would like to answer uh, the uh, gentleman's questions on the drug and the support to the war if, if anybody if you would like to add anything on it so over to you. Well, uh, thank you for these uh, these questions. Uh, just to clarify, I think that the, what I labeled as the international narrative is one which focuses on the issue of legitimacy. Um, what is happening now is, is basically it, it acted as a kind of uh, of uh, um, a reference for some for some for some time, but it rapidly became a kind of irrelevant. And what we're seeing now is that. Uh, uh, this issue of legitimacy and this issue of the actual international narrative has sort of been abandoned and it is uh, being uh, uh, erased in a way by the uh, imposition or by the, the prevalence of uh, the regional narrative, which actually kind of erases uh, 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 the issue of any legitimacy. Um, Meaning that uh, the actual government, or uh, that's why I said the so-called legitimate government, is is being sidelined by the fact that there is a focus on uh, uh, the the role of regional players, and it is the responsibility of these regional players, which is being pushed forward, to actually solve what is happening in Yemen. And this is the whole uh, the whole discussion that we're having regarding the uh, the Iranian uh, uh, Saudi agreement and regarding also. The discussions between the Houthis and uh, the uh, the Saudis. Um, so each uh, each narrative, in a way, has pushed forward a different different kinds of tools, and the tools which are uh, 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 prevailing now are ones linked to the regional narrative. Um, regarding the last question on accountability mechanisms, I think they are uh, obviously important, and uh, as uh, uh, someone who who cares for. Uh, uh, human rights issues and who cares for reconstruction, um, obviously they will need to be taken into account. Uh, but what happens, and, and one probably needs to also understand that uh, it is going to be difficult to actually push in favor of uh, accountability and at the same time ask or request that uh, uh, the Saudis in particular, but also other, uh, other players participate in the reconstruction and fund the reconstruction. I think it is absolutely central that there will need to be at some point a, a kind of a, a agreement, but also a, a rationale where the Saudis uh, understand that it is in their best interest to actually have a stable Yemen. And uh, stability means uh, probably more than accountability, uh, a reconstruction. And also as uh, Ellen and Charles highlighted, uh, 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 um, a rationale which uh, understands that um, stability means also uh, um, a stable uh, economy. It also means uh, development opportunities for ordinary uh, ordinary Yemenis, not a crumbling uh, environment where people are just forced to to, to leave their homes. Helen. Yeah, thank you. 
Um, I think with respect to, to local water management, when at the moment, which is a very relevant question, since at the moment, what governance there is in Yemen is very local and is not, you know, except for the Houthi area, which is very centralized, but for the rest of the country. Um, I think in terms of that, at the moment, the only thing that local authorities can do is try and manage and ensure some level of conservation of water and eco and effective and economic use of water within the area that they control. A long-term policy which requires, you know, a, an actual technical analysis of availability of water and, you know, of its distribution and use and access is something that has can only be done on the basis of the actual, you know, any basin or supply area where where which is autonomous and unrelated to the next one. And there may be some of these that are under a single authority at the moment. And so there something could be done, but a lot of them may be under separate authorities because those areas are not defined by administration or by governorate. So I think, you know, at the moment, the best thing that local authorities can do and local communities can do is really try and make sure that their, their community level management is um, equitable and gives priority to human use um, insofar as that's actually possible. Thank you. Thank you, Helen. Uh, Charles? Uh, yeah, the, the question reminded me of uh, Hail Saeed. Hail Saeed is, is uh, a truly multinational corporation that, that came out of, of local Yemenis from Tayas. Uh, and they are one of the major importers. They, they Im import the grain and, and wheat into Yemen. Uh, and they've been working through Aden. Um, at the at the onset of the war, they were accused by the Southerners of being with Ali Abdullah Salak and hiding Ali Abdullah Salak's troops in their silos in, in Aden. Uh, and so they were attacked. And now uh, the Houthi are attacking them because they are with the South and <laughs> they're with the PLC. So, uh, you know, you can't win in these political fights. But but uh, the the. I, I think the goal, the, the Houthi are driving a really hard bargain right now, and they want to drive control of the economies into their hands. They're going to be ruthless in trying to get uh, control of the economy in their hands. Um, and uh, I, I don't see it along sectarian lines. It's just uh, whether you uh, are willing to work with the Houthi or, or not. And uh, uh, that's basically going to be the determinant of who gets a, a small slice of the commercial pie. Thank you. I would like to give just half a minute maybe to Noel to conclude since he uh, opened this discussion. So over to you and then to Jerry. Thank you. Oh. Uh, thank you, uh, thank you, uh, Amat. Uh, I um, okay, uh, I really have very little to add. I think we've heard from the the real experts this this, this afternoon. And uh, the, only, uh, the only question I think it was unanswered was about the Iranian uh, possible Iranian involvement in in, uh, in drug smuggling. I'm not aware of, uh, of 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 evidence of that. I'm not saying it do doesn't exist. There's certainly a lot of drug smuggling going out. But I think the the, the main Iranian support uh, to the Houthis is uh, through the provision of. Uh, um, uh, um, part of a transfer of technology for some of the uh, the drone parts, but 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 also the supply of uh, key um, uh, key key targeting systems linked to those uh, drones and missiles. Um, and there's some evidence that that that, that is that, that is can be delivered and and withheld. And there's there's very little doubt also that the uh, Iranians have had a role in helping the Houthis move from the small formation fighting they were doing at the very beginning of, of the war to the much larger uh, formations one saw in in um, uh, in the fighting in Marib, uh, which went on for, for, for about a year. Um, but but I think the, the what was drives the, the Iranians as much as anything else is the, is the, is the regional uh, uh, conflict with Saudi Arabia. And this is why there's some hope now that with re-establishment of diplomatic relations between Tehran and uh, uh, Riyadh, that, that that may be uh, that, that may be uh, reduced. Inshallah. Over to you, Jerry. Thank you so much. 
Uh, thank you, Amat, and uh, please join me in, in thanking a, a great uh, first panel. Uh, Noel Brahoni, Laurent Bonafoy, uh, Helen Lochner, Charles Schmitz, and especially our, uh, our uh, moderator, Amata Soswa. Uh, we will now uh, take a 15 minute break. Uh, there is lunch available. Uh, please help yourselves. Uh, return to your seats, if you would, by uh, 1215. Uh, and we'll uh, begin our next presentation, which is our keynote address with Ambassador Tim Wenderking. Thank you. <laughs>